Welcome to the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm Sari Shrike, the artist and creator behind Not Sorry Art and Not Sorry Art School. I'm so excited to talk art and creativity with you. So grab a drink, grab a snack, and let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to the inaugural episode of the Not Sorry Art Podcast. I'm so excited for y'all to be here, and let's just jump into the episode. So today we're talking about both the pitfalls and the promise of potential. Um, I am very much an optimist, right? And because of that, potential is a very exciting thing for me, but it wasn't always the case. In fact, potential is something that I would say was the key motivator behind my year and a half of artist block after I graduated with a degree in art. And I, I often think about this duality behind potential, how it can both be something that motivates you. And I, I, what I love about potential is it has like a very egalitarian sort of mission to it. It's this idea that anyone, even if they're not currently doing something, project, whatever it, it may be, could have the potential to do something. And that you can't just write anyone out based on what they are or are not showing you. And I, I love that. I think, you know, the bones of that is beautiful. And I very much um, you know, believe that everyone has the potential to be creative in some capacity. And so, you know, I, I, for that reason, I think it's fantastic. But I also know that sometimes we put so much pressure on potential and how perfect it is in our mind and how shiny and untouchable and un, unsullied by our mistakes and our effort, you know, it, it can be in our head. And then when we actually try to materialize it, um, sometimes that can be really hard for us. And it's something that I've overcome. It's something that I feel very, uh, have lots of nuanced thoughts and feelings about. And so I just wanted to hash it out in this episode and chat through it with you guys. This brings me to the inspiration for this episode, actually. So it was about this time last year. Um, I'm a painter. I do this series of paintings called my disco walls. And basically, they're just really colorful. And they're on circle canvases. And this time last year, I was preparing for a January 1st disco ball drop, which just is a collection that I was putting up on my website January 1st. And so I have this drop cloth, which is like a piece of fabric that I put on my wall to protect it from all the leftover paint um, that usually goes everywhere when you're making a big painting. And so the drop cloth is covered in all these bright colors and it's very messy and sort of chaotic looking. I think it's kind of beautiful, but it, it definitely looks chaotic. And I put this big, white, bright, freshly gessoed canvas on my wall. And it was really striking to me. And I took a photo of it and I kept thinking about it over the next couple of days. And I realized what I thought was so wonderful about it was that it very perfectly to me encapsulated my current relationship with potential. This bright, white canvas, you know, that you can make anything on top of. You could, you know, draw on top of it, you, it could turn into anything. It could be a masterpiece. It could be a portrait. It could be a disco ball. It could, it could be anything. And then all of this gunky paint around it that kind of shows you the history of other paintings that came before it. And not all of them were amazing. And a lot of them got sanded over and I had to paint on them again. And, you know, some of them were kind of in the middle and they were just okay paintings. And there were a couple of paintings that came, you know, I, I have a drop cloth for maybe six months to a year. So let's just say for that year prior, I had this drop cloth. I usually have a couple of paintings a year that I just, I love. And I'm it, it does live up to sort of this potential that I see in myself. And so to see all of those marks that came before it surrounding this dark, new, crisp canvas feels like where I'm at now with my conversation and my thoughts around potential. The thing is, while I'm incredibly grateful for potential, I'm also deeply critical of it. And I think the issue is that if we don't have our inner perfectionist sort of in check, potential gets away from us really, really fast, right? It, the thing is, when potential lives inside of our head, it's perfect. It's, it's, it's without mistakes. You don't picture potential and also see all the swings and misses and all of the slip ups and all the times you sort of had to renegotiate your goals and your vision and, you know, all the the things that come with a true practice, whatever it may be, because life is is messy. Life is imperfect. It's not going to go the way you have it envisioned. And a lot of times potential doesn't take those things into account. And I think it's totally fine. I, you know, how can you map out all your mistakes? You don't know. I mean, 
it's mistakes a lot of times are just you sort of playing ping pong with the universe like you you have your goal and your intention and your aim and the universe sort of says no never mind back at you and then you change and you modify and you know that's why we can't as 18 year olds look down our whole life and plan out what exactly it's going to be i mean no matter how steadfast or lucky you get, there's going to be things that you don't see coming at you and it's going to change the way things go. And as someone who has a creative practice, I've become intimately aware of this. I feel like more than making art, more than making something beautiful or aesthetic, a creative practice very quickly teaches you the nature of that game of ping pong that you're playing with the universe, right? The unexpectedness, the fact that you really don't have that much control. You can control your consistency and your attitude and that's about it that being said it's it's hard it's impossible even to to perfectly picture how things are going to be and so when they live in your head they're mistake free and they're shiny and they're bright and they're larger than life but the minute we try to go after it and we try to start that bridge start connecting our action to that potential if and when we fall short or if and when there are mistakes or things don't go according to plan it can be really scary. And I think the best way to describe that sensation, at least the way I felt it, is that it can kind of feel like grief, that there's a little bit of having to let go of that shiny potential that you had in your head. And especially if that potential was your North Star or it got you out of a really tricky situation. So to speak a little bit to my experience with it, my potential was just that. It was my North Star for a long, long time. I had a really tough childhood. I um, grew up in persistent poverty. My parents on and off both struggled with addiction. And there was all the trappings that come with that in my, my home growing up. And I went to underfunded schools. And going to college was a hope, but definitely not a reality for me. And I, despite making good grades, you know, it's just, it's hard to escape poverty. The stats about it are really grim. You know, I think it would have been a victory for me to just graduate high school. But I found running as an outlet um, in a lot of ways just to get out of the house <laughs> and physically be out in nature. It really saved my life in multiple ways. But, uh, you know, like anything, if you're consistent, you eventually get decent at it. And I was able to get a scholarship at a Division II school. And it was in town, so I was able to keep my, you know, fast food job. And I was able to go to college. And, um, you know, college was hard. There's obviously a lot of class conflict um, and learning that comes when you go from a very underfunded <laughs> school system and way of life to all of a sudden, you know, you are roommating with kids who have who grew up with nannies. It's just a culture shock. And it was hard. You know, I had to work a job to pay for my food and bills and car uh, while being a full-time student athlete, while maintaining grades. And it was really challenging, really hard. It really drained me. And, you know, the kind of persistence that it took to get up at 6 a.m. to go run, you know, eight miles with the team and then to shower and then to go to class and then to go to your second practice and then to go to your other class and then to go to work and then to get off at midnight and start the whole thing over. The thing that kept me going was the idea that there is potential and I could achieve something, especially if I got to the other end of this, you know, hard you know, season of life that I was going through. And so for me, it was really... The idea of being able to be an artist or a graphic designer and to have income and to get health insurance and to to make it out of generations of trauma that my all of my family before me had never gotten out of, this was a shiny, bright North Star. And it I cannot emphasize to you guys how important it was. So whenever I graduated and I did it, I crossed through the finish line and I sat down to make art. And I applied for jobs to get, you know, a nice graphic design job. And I kept not doing it. I kept not getting the jobs. I kept not making art that I was proud of. The best way I can describe that sensation was just grief. And it was that grief that kept me locked up and it kept me from moving forward. Because having to grieve another rejection letter or having to grieve an art project that fell short and didn't look as good as anything I made in college. And of course, in hindsight, it makes sense. I no longer had my studio. You know, I was in a tiny little apartment and uh, I no longer had my professors and mentors and peers. And I no longer had a grade hanging over my head. <laughs> if I didn't go and paint, like I wouldn't, you know, I didn't have that external motivation anymore. 
So, of course, in hindsight, like I wasn't going to make fantastic art. And when you're in that emotional state, you don't always have the insight to be able to understand why those things are happening. Um, you know, you can logic your way out of it. But when you're feeling something as heavy as grief or having to accept that the way you saw your life is not going to happen, um, it can be hard to see all those details and be rational about it. And that was exactly how I was I was feeling. So it kept me from making art for a year and a half. And I remember it was January 1st of 2016. I promised myself that I would make art every day for a year. And truthfully, I know it seems like now I can sit here seven years later with art as my full-time job. I can sit here and be like, well, it was great because like it eventually snowballed. But at the time when I made this promise to myself to do one drawing a day, um, the goal was really to see if at the end of the year I still even liked art. That's how kind of lost and unsure of myself I felt, right? I, I love, I've always loved art, but missing that potential I think can be so devastating that you really kind of question who you are. And that is certainly where I was. Part of it's also your early 20s are just a wild time. <laughs> So during this time, I also had a, a young baby. You know, I was two months old when I started this daily art project. And I set aside one of his naps. He, you know, took two or three naps a day. And for the first nap of the day, I would sit down and I did a little drawing. And I posted it to Instagram for the sake of accountability. For a little bit of insight, Instagram back in 2016, 2015, 2016, uh, was not the creative storefront marketplace it is now. It was a place where you could snap a picture of your brunch and put a Valencia filter on it and share it with your friends. Uh, so I was posting every day to Instagram and I was making not great art, admittedly. And I've, I've talked about my story a little bit before and I always get some pushback when I say it was not good art. And that's understandable. I think when you're pushing through perfectionism, you sort of have two avenues you can take. You can either sort of rebrand what you consider bad art and sort of say, okay, well, all art is valuable. It teaches you something. I'm not going to label it as bad. I'm going to be non-objective. And I think that's great. That would not have worked for me at the time. <laughs> I was just really in a bad headspace. And so I needed to make bad art and label it bad art and not work on that part of the mindset and just teach myself teach my physical body that I was going to be okay even if I didn't make something great. Even if I posted something that was cringy and uncomfortable and just, you know, whatever, bad, I guess, um, that I would not dissolve. I would not just like suffer pain and, and just like, I don't know, just like whatever you imagine is going to happen whenever you do something that's really uncomfortable. <laughs> it's not logical. But anyways, and the, the trick is you do this long enough, you sort of show up, post something cringy, and you do teach your body on like a cellular level, I think, that it's you won't die. You can post bad art and you live to see another day. And there wasn't a ton of progress in that first year. I wish I could tell you that in the span of one year, everything changed. But that wasn't really my goal. It was just to see what would happen. And I did get a little bit better, but I still didn't have, at the end of that first year, I still didn't have more than a nap time to spare. I still barely working with watercolors. I think I finally did switch out to an acrylic setup, but it was like, again, my t my apartment was so tiny and it was, um, I got rid of my TV and put a child gate around where my entertainment center was. <laughs> and I just hung up a drop cloth and put a, 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 a nails in the wall and I painted on that and I had a little table. And it was tiny and I had to like, it was just very makeshift, but it worked for me. It was fine. But, you know, I, I wasn't like in a place where all of a sudden I was a full-time artist and everything had changed. Like it was still hard. I was still sp fighting for all of those spare minutes to paint. And, um, but it goes to show you how much a mindset shift can really change your practice because I wasn't, still wasn't making money from this. I still was not, I didn't have a ton of time. Um, and I, you know, not a lot had changed other than the fact that I had made my art practice part of my daily life. And I think that that's no small feat. And I think that's kind of what I want to tell you guys going forward is that in order to have an art practice, everything doesn't have to be perfect. Your medium doesn't have to be perfect. The time you have doesn't have to be perfect. And certainly the art you make isn't going to be perfect. 
And and that's okay. Because for me, I was so much happier at the end of that year, not necessarily with my art, but that I was doing it, that I had found that, yes, I do love making art. And the process is really enjoyable. And being the kind of person who, even when you're not making art, you're sort of walking around with the eye of an artist, you know, anything could be art, was what I loved about art making. And so I found a way to become an artist that was really detached from this idea of potential. And it was a totally novel way of living my life and making goals. Because again, up until this point, I was very externally motivated and I was very motivated to reach this potential. And so I I was basically like a new baby when it comes to operating out of enjoyment and pleasure and curiosity. And it started out very meager. <laughs> it was a small little practice. It was cruddy little watercolors but it was it was through kindness and compassion in addition to sort of restructuring how I thought about my practice that gave me the tools to eventually turn my practice into what it is now which the irony being that it's far exceeded what I could have envisioned at the time and I didn't want to lead with that because I've heard people say that that you know if you get too hung up on your potential you may never see what the universe is going to offer you And, and I agree with that but I also want to let you know that even if things don't dramatically improve even if you don't become a full-time artist overnight that there's still value in reframing how you think of your practice and sort of demoting potential and perfectionism and letting yourself just make with reckless abandon and you know it took a long time it took years before I was able to make income off of it it took years before I even had its own dedicated space to make art and it took up until like a year and a half ago before I was able to do this on a full-time scale. I was doing this all very part-time and I sure I felt limited by that, but it's the patience and the compassion and the love of art that I learned during this time that has become a much bigger and better fuel for my art practice than the anxiety around living up to my potential or that perfectionism could ever fuel my motivation. And so it's because of this relationship that I had and because of hard lessons that I was taught from over-idealizing my potential that I sort of walked into last year, you know, this time last year, with this sort of, I think, unknowing chip on my shoulder about potential and sort of just being critical of, of how much overvaluing my potential had caused me in my past. But that being said, in the years since, I've maybe softened a little bit to the idea of of potential and, you know, to kind of get back to what I was saying at the top, I have developed sort of this more nuanced understanding of the role that both of them play. Because, you know, whether I labeled it potential or not, you know, that that ability to look up and sort of gaze into the future and set goals and become excited about what could happen has crept back in. I really was motivated for a long time of about just showing up and doing the work and really not thinking into the future and not applying for things or planning. And whether that's good or bad advice, who who's to say? But, you know, as I think I've healed that wound a little bit, as I've sort of found my center and myself and become motivated by different things over the years, the idea of inviting back in that sort of optimism about the future has made more sense to me. And I think whenever I looked at that painting, uh, that, you know, the disco ball canvas, rather, on my messy, messy drop cloth, it reminded me that those things need to live in tandem and that you can find a balance. And, you know, our culture may favor one over the other because messiness and mistakes and quiet diligence and you know, working and putting your nose to the grindstone and all that stuff is a lot less flashy. It's hard to market and advertise on social media. It's it's hard to make content about that, but um, but it's valuable nonetheless. And so I guess I'm getting to the part of the podcast where I've shared my story, I've shared my insight, and now I'm I'm talking to you as an artist, whether you have a practice, whether you're wanting to grow your practice, or or maybe it's a practice that still largely lives inside of your heart. I, I think I just want to encourage you that if, if you can do something this year, you know, if you want to start a practice and if you don't, that's okay. And I also want to take a moment to say that you may legitimately not be in a space where you can start a practice. You might have 
plenty of valid concerns. I could list them for for hours. You know, anything from I just don't feel like it to you have a chronic, you know, health concern that's you draining your energy levels to maybe you're taking care of children or you're one of those sandwich generation people who are taking care of parents and children. There are so many a hundred percent valid excuses to well, I don't want to call it an excuse, but like valid reasons um, to not be able to to do art, and and that's totally fine. And you know, I think the thing is when if someone's asking like, well, how do I know? How do I know if if I'm putting off this art practice because I'm scared of uh, falling short? Or how do I know if I'm putting off this art practice because of valid reasons? I think the question you have to ask yourself is, is the thought of not doing it at all scarier than the thought of doing it and, and sucking <laughs> and being bad and making bad art? Because if if that's the case, if it's if you if if it's scarier to think that it may never happen or it won't happen now or that you, you're you're saying no to it again, if that's scarier, then I think you do need to sit with the idea of of maybe reevaluating your goals or putting your goals on on pause and you know to telling your inner perfectionist to just hang on a sec and and making art anyways and and being okay with that. But you know if if you're in a place and only you can tell where you really don't have the resources right now, that's totally valid too. And you may be in a place where I was in college where that potential is that guiding light for you. And in, in that case, like do whatever works. There's no right or wrong here. I don't think you could have told me my sophomore year of college that I needed to find a different way to be motivated because unfortunately the truth of the matter is not everyone has the ability to slow down and re-examine these things. They, they require time, space, energy, resources, and nuance, and not everyone has access to that. But but if you are listening to this and this is speaking to you and you do feel like you want to make a leap to try something new or bitter, bigger or better or a different goal or whatever it may be, um, I want to remind you that it's okay to be messy. It's okay to fall short of your expectations. It's okay for it to be imperfect. It's okay for it to not be something that's worthy of sharing on social media. Because, and that's another aspect that we can go into it in a different podcast, but you're comparing yourself to everyone on their best day everyone who might be exceeding their potential or who might be doing this for years or might be in a place where their years of hard work are finally paying off. And it's just, it's really not fair to compare yourself to that. Sort of the last analogy that I want to offer you is something I've been thinking about for a while about people wanting to start a creative practice. I don't know if it's because I'm I'm pretty prolific, but a lot of times when I finally get a chance to talk to uh, other artists or maybe people who follow me or other creative people, usually one of the things that comes up is that they'll say, oh, I've been wanting to get back into painting, but I, you know, I don't have time or energy or resources. And again, it's nothing that I can tell you. And, you know, whether I, I, I could look at all of your facts, I could look at an intimate journal of your life, and I could still, I ultimately not be the one to tell you whether or not you have time or energy for a creative practice. That's totally a personal call. But People tell me this a lot, and I, I think it's just sort of to gauge my thoughts on it. And I will say the only piece of advice I can sort of give there is I often compare a creative practice to like a running practice or some other exercise practice only in the sense that you don't typically get paid to run. I just substitute this with any other kind of practice, but I'm going to use running for this analogy. You know, unless you're like super duper elite level runner. And, and even then, it's really not a very lucrative <laughs> industry to get into. You know, you don't get paid to go on a five mile run or to train for a half marathon or, or a 10K or something like that. But everyone around you or most people, or at least culturally, there's sort of this agreement that exercise is really good for your mental health. It may or may not be good for your physical health, depending on your exercise. Um, but it's valuable nonetheless, despite the fact that you're not going out and you, no one's paying you 30 bucks to run five miles. It's something that we do to sort of enrich our lives. And prior to like the running boom of the 1970s, if you had told your partner or your people who maybe help you watch your kids or whatever, that you're going to go spend an hour running around the neighborhood <laughs> uh, before there was sort of this cultural consensus around the value of exercising, it would have it would have seemed odd. There would have been a lack of shared agreement that that's a valuable thing to spend your time on. Now, post the running boom and post, you know, the health boom, which I'm not 
condoning or saying it's good or bad. But regardless, it transformed the way our culture looks at exercise. Now, if you tell your support system, hey, I'm training for a half marathon and I'm going to need to spend more time running, like other people would value that too. And I think you would value it because there's already a precedent for that being valuable time and energy. Um, I think that we should view creative work sort of in a similar capacity. There's all kinds of studies that say that creativity is nourishing to your brain and your mental health and it can help heal trauma. And, you know, you can list off things that it's really good for in the same way that you could list off going for a long walk or a a slow run or something like that. And I find that a lot of times the thing keeping people from setting aside that 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, hour a day, two hours a day, whatever, to have a creative practice um, is the anxiety that other people, and even on some level, maybe yourself, won't value that time spent in the way that you want to spend that value. And I think to rope it all back to potential A lot of times, if you can't prove that that time is valuable by getting into a gallery, by selling your artwork, whatever, insert your specific goal here, it can be really scary to ask people to help you, ask your community to allow you the time to create. So my last piece of advice for you today would be to sort of treat your creative practice in the same manner that you would some other enriching practice that we all culturally value. And I know that when I started doing that, when I started making it clear to my partner that my art practice was something I needed to be fulfilled and happy and that it was worth the, you know, buying paints and all that stuff, you know, within reason, but that once you start treating yourself like an artist, once you start giving your practice the respect, even if it doesn't live up to potential, right, even if it's messy and imperfect and not the best of your ability, When you start valuing that effort anyways, that's where magic happens. That's where things start to click. And, you know, if I can encourage you to give yourself the time, not only the 20 minutes a day, but the year, two years, five years it might take to really fully realize that, again, that's that's where the magic happens. That's where I think the best things, you know, happen. And you have to give yourself time. Creativity is a long game. And I know time is a limited resource, but it's it's valuable work. And it's worthy work. And so I want to leave you with an image to put on your your vision board or just to have in your mind. And I want you to look at the cover art, the um the artwork for this podcast and see that messy drop cloth with that big circle canvas. And instead of focusing on the canvas, I want you this year or whenever you listen to this, to focus on creating a messy drop cloth to focus on creating all the other byproducts, the other messiness that happens when the creative process happens, and to really not worry about the canvases hung in the middle. And if you can prioritize making a mess in some way, whether that's literal or metaphorical, that that's a much better place to put your heart and your intention. And to some degree, I still do that. And it's, I find it very liberating and very helpful. And it's, creates that space for curiosity and play that the other kind of pressure doesn't always leave space for. And I hope I hope that this was helpful or insightful. I hope you walk away both invigorated and maybe calm down a little bit. This is, I think this is the kind of, I'm hoping to make these podcasts the kind of thing that I wish I could have heard six, seven years ago, you know, eight years ago when I felt so lost um so i hope this reaches the right people thank you again for listening happy creating i i wish you the best and i'll talk to you next week thanks guys thank you so much for listening to today's episode if you found it at all helpful or encouraging or if you just felt compelled to say something make sure to leave a review and as a thank you i will read off the reviews in the next episode and make sure to leave your handle so you can consider it a thank you shout out Also, today's episode was sponsored by Not Sorry Art School. It's my art school that I started, and it teaches all about the fundamentals of painting representationally. It also teaches lots of other art-related things. If you are at all interested in painting or color theory or portraiture or master studies and you want to be part of a growing community of other creatives, make sure to check it out. There's more information on the website. As always, thank you so much for listening and happy creating. 